Welcome, everyone, to episode 77. Today, we'll be moving along in this first series in animal physiology by exploring the topic of animal reproduction. Just like plants and fungi, animals can reproduce through a variety of mechanisms. However, where many individual species of plants and fungi can reproduce both asexually and sexually, an individual animal species can typically only reproduce through one or the other mechanism. Animal species that can reproduce sexually and asexually are relatively rare. They represent only a small minority of the branches coming off of this part of the tree of life. But as I'll go on to explain, this is really only the beginning of the weirdness that is animal reproduction. As with the analogous episodes for plants and fungi, I'll start out with the asexual means of reproduction. Asexual reproduction is, essentially, an organism's ability to clone itself. The offspring will share the same genetic information as its parent, and if the environmental conditions are similar, then the offspring will grow up to be a virtually perfect copy of its parent. Now, this asexual reproductive strategy has some benefits, but it also has some downsides. Some of the benefits include the ease of replication, because they don't have to spend time or energy searching for a mate, or raising young. And this also gives the individual the ability to colonize an entire region. You know, they just will clone themselves and fill up the whole mountain valley, or ocean reef, or whatever habitat it is. Some of the downsides to asexual reproduction include low genotypic and phenotypic variety, and thus there's a dangerous vulnerability to diseases and changing environmental conditions. Furthermore, any mutations that are generated in an asexual organism will be passed on to its clonal offspring. So across the entire lineage, you know, across multiple generations, these mutations will accumulate, and over time, they will degrade the fitness of the lineage until it dies out. These risks apply to all asexual organisms, from animals to fungi to bacteria. Asexual reproduction is a simple and primitive means of reproduction, which is one of many reasons why it's a trait that's overwhelmingly found in simpler animals, like sea anemones, corals, and hydra. Hydra, for example, reproduce asexually through budding. Now, the hydra are small, primitive Nidarian organisms. They're the sisters of jellyfish, with tube-shaped bodies ringed at one end with feeding tentacles. Species that are in the hydra genus have a remarkable regenerative capacity, and they don't seem to experience aging. As the hydra live their potentially unending lives, they will create buds, which are little projections that will grow laterally out of their bodies. These buds will extend, forming the body of the offspring, and when it's reached the proper stage of maturity, or ripeness, it simply breaks off and becomes a free-floating individual. Another asexual method is called fission, which is like an elegant form of fragmentation. The body of the parent literally splits apart to produce two descendants, or a piece breaks off and this new piece regenerates into a new mature individual. The animals that can reproduce through this uh, fission or uh, elegant fragmentation method, these animals include corals, flatworms and annelids, and echinoderms like starfish. Through the process of archetomy, the animal can split apart from a specific point with no preparation needed, and each part will then regenerate missing organs and structures and become a new individual. Through the process of peritomy, the animal will chemically and physiologically prepare itself for a split. The split itself occurs like the copy is getting peeled out of the side of the original. From the point of separation, a second head will emerge which pulls away to the side as the rest of the offspring's body is developed. All of this grows outward until it fully splits apart, or buds off. Peritomy can be compared to budding, as they're both similar processes. They're just oriented differently along the body axes. A particularly rare form of asexual reproduction is called parthenogenesis, 
which is the unfertilized generation of a zygote. In this case, the fetus is generated from an egg produced by mitosis, which doesn't require fertilization, or in another way, by an egg that's produced by meiosis, which then experiences a chromosome duplication. This will create a clone of the mother organism with no father. Now, parthenogenesis is relatively rare. It's rare in the animal kingdom, being present in only a few species of fish, reptiles, some birds, and several invertebrates. However, in the species that can do it, it's not all that rare at all. Some species will only reproduce this way as a fluke or a genetic accident, like the zebra finch and the Komodo dragon, and they just kind of roll with it, and they, they'll reproduce normally most of the time, but this can happen, and it, it's not fatal. They can, they can work with it. For example, the Nemetophorus tigris, or the western whiptail, and the Nemetophorus inornatus, or the little striped whiptail, are two closely related species of lizard living in North America. These two species can interbreed to create a hybrid, called the Nemetophorus neomexicanus, which is an all-female species. The hybrids are always female, and they can reproduce through parthenogenesis to produce more clonal females. It's a really amazing aspect of biology that it doesn't just adapt evolutionarily on massive timescales, it also adapts on a much smaller timescale, where a few generations can skip across a genetic gradient and create individuals with radically different reproductive strategies. Another kind of dynamic reproductive response is expressed in crustaceans of the Daphnia genus. These are very small crustaceans, measured in millimeters, which can change their reproductive strategy according to the season. In the spring and the summer, they can reproduce asexually through parthenogenesis. But in the fall, they'll alter their reproductive strategy in a way that makes them now able to produce males in addition to females. And so the Daphnia in the winter months will begin reproducing sexually. Research has found that it's not just this changing of the seasons that triggers the shift from asexual to sexual reproduction. Other critical factors are population density and the availability of food. In places where there aren't a lot of other Daphnia, and there's a lot of food, and the days are long and warm and sunny, there isn't a lot of stress on the Daphnia living in this habitat, so they will happily reproduce asexually. However, when they're exposed to stresses and dangers, they begin reproducing sexually so as to generate and preserve genetic diversity and variety, which can potentially help the population survive whatever stressor is working against them. For example, in late summer, there's been a population explosion as newborn Daphnia feed and grow and mature. The water becomes dirtied with waste and flakes of tissue and detritus from dead bodies, and food will begin to run low. Disease and hunger will take hold. And these pressures, these stressors, will prime the Daphnia to begin reproducing sexually, so as to generate diversity in their offspring. The diversity improves the chances that some of these offspring will be able to tolerate the stressors and survive it, to continue to perpetuate the population, or at the very least, their genetic lineage. Although many animals reproduce asexually, many more reproduce sexually with a male and a female generating a fertilized egg. Just like how there are different methods to reproduce asexually, and there are different techniques among each of these methods, there are also different ways to reproduce sexually. There are different variables and strategies that animals use to preserve or maintain a balance between breeding males and breeding females that can optimally perpetuate their species. In some species, if members of a particular sex aren't available to reproduce, some individuals can change their sex to fill the gap, like in mushroom corals. In other species, a shift in the social hierarchy can cause a sex change, like in the case of clownfish. The clownfish social hierarchy is dominated by a female, and after she dies, after the alpha female dies, she gets replaced by the largest male, but only after he turns into a female. In wrasse fish, the process is similar, but it works in an opposite direction. 
the social hierarchy has a male dominating a large group of breeding females, and when that alpha male dies, the largest, most dominant female will turn into a male and take his place. As is the case in plants, and with some sex-analogous mating types of fungi, the animal sexes, male and female, possess corresponding types of gametes and specialized reproductive structures called gonads. The male possesses gonads called testes, which generate sperm, while the female possesses gonads called ovaries, which produce eggs. Both the ovaries and the testes are housed in their own specialized reproductive structures corresponding to the individual's sex, which is determined by genetic and hormonal processes that take root during gestation. Okay, so in a few minutes, we're going to get into all of this microscopic stuff, like the gametes, you know, gametogenesis, fertilization, all that stuff. But before any of this can happen at the cellular scale, at the macroscopic scale, two mature animals have to meet in the wild. They have to attract each other and engage in sexual intercourse. Or for those animals that leave behind spermatophores, the mate will just have to find that. It's a bit less romantic. Across the vast breadth of the animal kingdom, all manner of strategies have been evolved to attract a mate. If you've ever gone outside and listened to the songbirds chirping in the warm afternoon air, what you're hearing is a mating call. The bird is trying to sing a particular song, the notes and sequence of which activate profoundly powerful neural circuits in the bird's brain. If a male songbird, for example, can make the song really well, it's perceived as really attractive to female songbirds, and they'll come towards the source of the sound. Many animals, most of them mammals and birds, typically use some manner of calls or shouts or cooing noises or some kind of sound, all in the attempt to attract the attention of a potential mate. There's also a strong visual component to attracting a mate. Consider the peacock. The males possess huge, beautiful tail feathers, which are actually so large that they hinder its ability to fly efficiently. The reason this trait has been selected for, despite its negative consequences, is because the female peacocks use the size and color of the male's tail feathers to determine his health and his fitness. A large, brightly colored tail suggests a male that's healthy and able to feed himself reliably. And because female peacocks are choosy, they will reliably choose the males that have the brightest, largest tail feathers. In a more general sense, this is referred to as a Fisherian runaway effect. This is where the sexual proclivities or uh, preferences of one sex affects the morphology or ornamentation of the other sex in a dramatic way. You know, a lesser version of this is just sexual dimorphism, where there's sexual differences between males and females, and these sexual dimorphisms may be sources of attraction to the opposite sex. But in the case of a Fisherian runaway a phenomenon, this happens when this uh, sexual dimorphism has become so extreme, or the ornamentation has become so extreme, that it actually gets in the way. It has some kind of negative, deleterious consequence. But it's still selected for because the opposite sex finds it so attractive. Most species will use some kind of visual evaluation of their potential mates, as it's a pretty easy way to assess their health and fitness. Sometimes the potential mate will do a dance, or it'll uh, flash off some bright colors, or some ornamentation, like the peacock with his tail, or the caribou, or the moose with his antlers. Pheromones also play a role in attracting a mate. Pheromones are biochemical odorants released by one individual, which can be spread through the air or through the water to be detected by and to hopefully attract other potential mates. Almost all animals use some kind of pheromones, be they bivalves, arthropods, or vertebrates. Depending on the species, the pheromones can be detected more than 10 kilometers away. Now this, this is the case, for example, with a certain species of moth and butterfly. These pheromones provide a kind of chemical trail leading one prospective mate through the habitat, through the ecosystem, to the other, so that they'll, they'll physically meet and have the chance to reproduce. However it happens, whatever strategy they use, two individuals of the opposite sex will meet, somewhere in the wilderness. 
They've done their mating dance, or their mating songs, and they've engaged in intercourse. And at this point, the process of animal reproduction takes place at the cellular scale, with the gonads and the gametes. So right now, it's time to explore how these gametes are made. We're going to explore the process of gametogenesis, or more specifically, spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Spermatogenesis is the formation of sperm, which in mammals begins with a diploid cell found in the testes called a spermatogonium. This spermatogonium cell is like any other typical diploid cell. It can reproduce through mitosis to produce more spermatogonium cells, but it can also produce specialized offspring cells called primary spermatocytes. These primary spermatocytes are also diploid, but they quickly undergo the meiosis I process to produce two secondary spermatocytes, each being haploid, with a single copy of the chromosome. These secondary spermatocytes, half the size of their parent cell, will undergo meiosis II, and they each produce two even smaller haploid cells called spermatids. So the original cell is a large diploid spermatogonium, and after a round of mitosis and two rounds of meiosis, it's turned into four small haploid spermatid cells. These spermatids will then undergo a short development process. The nucleus of the spermatid will get positioned in the forming head region, and behind this forms the neck and the midpiece. The neck contains a centriole, which is involved in healthy fertilization, and the midpiece is stuffed with mitochondria. All of these mitochondria will power the tail, which is a single massive flagellum that whips around to propel the spermatid head through the water, or whatever you want to call the biologically derived liquid matrix that the sperm lives within. After all of this, after all of this cellular division and growth and development, they are now mature sperm that can be released to fertilize an egg. Now the egg is generated through oogenesis, which is a little more nuanced than spermatogenesis. It begins with diploid cells in the ovary called oogonias, which undergo mitosis to produce a primary oocyte. This first part is very analogous to spermatogenesis, but after this, you'll see that things start to get a little different. So, the primary oocyte undergoes meiosis I to produce haploid daughter cells, but the daughter cells aren't identical. One daughter cell is called the secondary oocyte, and it does look similar to its parent cell, but it's just a little smaller. But the other daughter cell is called a polar body. This polar body cell is given hardly any cytoplasm, so it's really tiny. And because it's small, it's packed with a copy of the chromosome. It's negatively charged, and it's polar. The secondary oocyte and the polar body will each undergo meiosis II. The secondary oocyte produces a single ootid, which will mature into an ovum, or a mature egg cell that's ready to be fertilized by a sperm cell. In addition to the ootid, the secondary oocyte will also produce another polar body. The first polar body will also undergo the stages of meiosis II, but this just produces two more polar bodies. So, to, to summarize what's going on here, spermatogenesis starts with one cell and produces four sperm cells, while oogenesis starts with one cell and produces four cells, but only one of these cells is a fertile egg, and the other three are tiny polar bodies that decay and fall apart shortly after they're created. The egg is a critically valuable item, because it's literally the seed from which a new animal grows. The nutrients in the egg are the first nutrients consumed by the new individual, and so they have to last long enough to ensure proper initial development. In species that lay their eggs, the egg contains yolk, which is a fatty, protein-rich layer that nourishes the developing embryo. In animals that gestate their offspring internally, the egg doesn't need a yolk, as nutrients are actively shared with the offspring through a placenta, which is like an interface between the embryo and the mother's vascular system. What kind of structure the egg has largely depends upon the species in question, and the methods and strategies that that species has evolved to use to reproduce. So the first choice that an animal species might come to when it's evolving reproductive strategies is how to fertilize the eggs. Some animals, like mammals, use internal fertilization, 
where the eggs are held internally by the female, and the male deposits sperm into her body to fertilize the eggs. Other animals, like many species of fish, use external fertilization, where the eggs are released by the female into the external environment, and the male attempts to fertilize the eggs by spraying or releasing a cloud of sperm into the surrounding water. External fertilization is almost exclusively found in water-based habitats, because a watery solution like a river or a lake or the ocean is ideal for the three-dimensional spread of sperm, so as to maximize contact with uh, as many released eggs as possible. Furthermore, this is a relatively messy way to reproduce. The animals that use external reproduction will generate a huge amount of gametes, which you might expect from an evolutionary perspective. Because these animals are literally releasing their gametes out into the wild and dangerous environment in the, the hope that some sperm and egg will meet, it'll greatly improve the odds of fertilization if there's hundreds of thousands or even millions of gametes that are being released all at once. In contrast, animals that use internal fertilization will generate and release a much smaller number of gametes at a given time. This reproductive strategy is much more targeted and it's much less messy, so it doesn't require that nearly as much energy be invested in gamete production. In internal fertilization, the female animal holds the unfertilized eggs within her body, in her ovaries. The sperm has to be brought into the female into her reproductive tract in order to fertilize the eggs. And now here, there's two general strategies, and I'm willing to bet that you're probably familiar with the first strategy. Here, the male possesses a penis, which is like a sperm injector. The penis is inserted into the vagina, and after a period of mechanical stimulation, it will release sperm. This is the reproductive strategy that pretty much all mammals have evolved to use. The second strategy is a little more exotic, and while most species of salamander do this, it's a strategy that's mostly seen in invertebrate species like giant squids and butterflies. In this second strategy, the male will release his sperm, but not directly into the female's body. Instead, the male will package the sperm up into a, a, a globular mass, or like a, a globule, called a sperm ampulla, or a spermatophore. These look like slimy white balls, or strands, or some kind of gooey mass that gets left behind on the ground, or on some low-hanging leaves. The female will smell, or somehow detect, the spermatophore, and she'll move over to it, uh, grab onto it, and you start handling it, and insert it into whichever organ is present that leads to the reproductive organs and the eggs. So, one of the weirder aspects of this second reproductive strategy is that it is internal fertilization, but the parents never actually meet each other. The father just leaves a spermatophore behind, the mother comes along, finds it, and puts it in her body and that's how they reproduce. Anyways, once sperm is inside the female's reproductive organs, the sperm will follow chemical cues to find and race towards the eggs. Because multiple males can deposit sperm into the same female, it's quite possible for a female animal to be carrying the sperm from multiple males inside her at once. The sperm from one male will literally compete on a chemical level with all of the sperm from all of the other males, and this has some really interesting consequences. Most obviously is that the healthier sperm will generally be able to swim faster, and they'll be less vulnerable to the acidic conditions and the immune response of the female. This healthier sperm, from a presumably healthier male, will be more likely to find and fertilize the egg. However, it's been discovered that the second male to deposit sperm is actually far more likely to fertilize the female than the first male, and this is called the second male advantage. Incoming ejaculate is able to physically push out the fluid deposited by the earlier male. And there are numerous species, from insects to humans, that have evolved a penis with a flared tip. During the rhythmic motions of intercourse, the flared tip of the penis will produce a suction, or a sweeping effect, that can dislodge and pull out the previously deposited sperm of other males. In species where the female regularly mates with multiple males before fertilization, the males tend to grow larger testes and produce larger quantities of sperm. 
This is believed to be a compensatory factor for sperm competition, where the solution is to simply send in more competitors to improve the chances that one of them will fertilize the egg. One of the really interesting consequences of sperm competition is that it takes the evolutionary fitness and ecological competition and compacts it down to the scale of cells and chemicals. It's no accident that sperm competition also happens most often in social species that live in groups, which would naturally facilitate the female having ready access to multiple males. The neat thing here is that virtually all of the males get a chance at mating, but fitness is preserved because competition exists among the sperm, which represent the health and vitality of the male who produced it. The males themselves, as these macroscopic individual organisms, don't have to necessarily concern themselves too much with competition among each other, and this facilitates cooperative, constructive, and pro-social behavior. So most or all of the males get a chance to experience mating, which has social stabilizing benefits as they all get the perception that they've successfully reproduced, even if their sperm doesn't ultimately end up fertilizing the female. They aren't aware of what happens on a chemical level. So all of the energy that they would spend competing amongst each other for mates or for access to mates is now freed up to spend cooperating and helping the group. It also needs to be explained that the female is not a passive witness to this at all. In many species, the female will display a remarkable control over who fertilizes her eggs. Some females can store sperm from desirable males for a period of time, and they will tap this stored sperm to fertilize an egg when the conditions are optimal for producing offspring, even if they physically mated with that particular male a long time ago. In some species, females can also deliberately or chemically reject sperm from undesirable males. In some species, the female will deliberately choose which male gets to be the last to mate with her before fertilization, which is a strategy that exploits the second male advantage. The female will have her preferred mate copulate with her last, so as to give his sperm the edge in the sperm competition, and the best chance to fertilize her eggs. When fertilization actually occurs, the fused egg and sperm will become an embryo. Earlier in the episode, I mentioned how some species have eggs that have yolks, and the embryo feeds off the yolk. This is the case for oviparous species, where the embryo is grown inside of an enclosed sac called an egg. Eggs like this are specialized for the environment in which the animal lives. Reptile eggs are typically soft-shelled and require a dark, moist environment, or at the very least, they need to be buried underground, away from any lurking predators and the harsh heat and light of the sun. A bird's eggs are coated with a hard shell, which offers mechanical protection, and they're dotted with thousands of small pores that allow for gas exchange between the embryo inside the egg and the outside environment. Yolks also exist in the eggs of ovoviviparous animal species, which produce embryos in eggs that are retained inside the body. In this case, the yolk will feed the embryo, not the mother. In contrast, the embryos of viviparous animals don't have yolks, because the embryo is retained within the mother's body, and the mother will feed the embryo with nutrients from her own bloodstream. The period of the female's life where she is carrying one or more embryos within her body, either before laying the eggs or before giving live birth, is called pregnancy. Pregnancy is a radical change in the female's morphology. In humans, the uterus can expand to 500 times its normal size. In mammals, the breasts will swell as milk is produced to feed the incoming newborn. Nausea and disorientation may be frequent as the growing fetus pushes against and displaces other internal organs. Pregnancy is a really intense process, and it takes a huge toll on the mother's body. The chemical resources that are necessary to produce a healthy offspring they're tremendous. And because of this, the amount of attention and care that a mother can invest into her offspring is directly negatively correlated with the number of offspring she has. 
This is true for pretty much all animals, not just viviparous animals, and it's understood as the RK selection theory. So this, this RK selection theory posits that, fundamentally, there are trade-offs between the quality and the quantity of offspring that an animal can produce, and the, and the strategies that an animal uses to produce offspring puts it somewhere on a gradient between being R or K selected. Animal species that are R selected utilize a reproductive strategy that prefers raw quantity over quality. R selected species will produce a huge amount of offspring in a single litter. They'll all have small bodies that can grow to maturity quickly, and they have short generation times, meaning that these offspring can reproduce on their own shortly after being born. Despite this capacity for uh, rapid reproduction, they also have short lifespans and many individuals will die before they get a chance to reproduce. The parents don't invest that much attention or resources into their offspring, as they just usually lay the eggs, bury them or hide them, and then just leave. These are all traits that would be favored by animals that live in a dynamic, often changing environment, where rapid reproductive rates contribute to a greater evolutionary plasticity, and thus a greater ability to quickly react and adapt to stressors and changes in the environment. Our selected animals include many species of insects, many species of fish, and pretty much all rodents. These organisms also exist in ecological niches where their food is, more or less, unlimited. Even though they reproduce quickly and they have huge populations, they may not feel the effects of crowding, as there's usually more than enough available food. Our selected species are described as opportunistic because they find and exploit any niche or habitat they can. And this, combined with their rapid reproductive rates, leads to a relatively fast burst of divergence and speciation. They can rapidly adapt to a new habitat. Where the evolution of our selected species has generally found that quantity is a quality all its own, the K-selected species on the other end of the spectrum are much more focused on actual quality. Elephants, for example, are K-selected species. Bears tend to be K-selected species. Humans are a K-selected species. What this means is that K-selected species have a relatively small number of offspring, usually just one or two at a time, but they'll invest a huge amount of resources both material and emotional, into raising them. K-selected organisms tend to have longer periods of development and maturation, longer generations, longer lifespans, and larger body sizes. On an ecological level, K-selected species are optimized for stable environments where they have to compete for scarce resources to sustain both their relatively massive bodies and their populations which typically increase to and hover around the carrying capacity of the habitat. Because of this, the K-selected species tend to be vulnerable to massive or sustained changes in their environment. Anything that pushes them out of equilibrium, like the loss of a predator or the loss of a food source, will put them at risk. And because of their relatively slow reproductive rate and longer generation times, the K-selected species have a longer, more precipitous road to evolutionary and ecological recovery. All right, so where was I? Uh, earlier, I was talking about fertilization. Uh, fertilization occurs when the sperm meets the egg. Fertilization creates an embryo, and the embryo will develop and mature either in an egg, in an egg retained in the mother's body, or just retained in the mother's body with no egg involved. Now, as I was describing for viviparous species, Pregnancy involves radical changes to the female's body, as it stretches and adjusts to accommodate the growing embryo. The mother will produce more blood, and her blood vessels will dilate to hold it all, and the heart increases in size and beats faster, which all helps the mother support and feed the growth of the fetus. In some species, the combined mother-fetus circulatory system uses counter-current flow of maternal and fetal blood, so as to set up and maintain concentration gradients that enable a continuous flow of oxygen and nutrients into the fetus. In humans, we don't have this countercurrent flow. 
Instead, we've evolved to use a surface area-based method similar to what exists in our small intestine. Maternal blood in the placenta washes over little protrusions called villi, which are packed with fetal blood vessels. Diffusion carries nutrients from the mother's blood to the fetus, much like how nutrients from the chyme are absorbed by the small intestine. A downside to having a connected mother-fetus circulatory network is that any poisons or dangerous chemicals ingested by the mother will be shared with her fetus. In the natural world, this can be dangerous for both the fetus and the pregnant mother if the mother uh, eats something that she shouldn't, like a poisonous mushroom, or a dart frog, or if the mother gets infected with a blood parasite, or some other kind of disease. Anyways, as the fetus reaches viability and continues developing to term, the viviparous animal mother will eventually give birth. This is the moment wherein the mother's body dilates the birth canal, and the fully formed fetus gets pushed out into the world to open its eyes and take its first breath of air. In oviparous animals, the embryo will develop in the egg until it reaches its point of complete development, after which the offspring will physically break out of the egg. The reptiles will break out of their eggs relatively easily, as they're equipped with claws and their eggshells are soft and wet. The birds have a harder shell, so they've evolved an egg tooth, or a small point or a horn on their beak that they use to hammer at and break open their egg. Once the offspring has been born, it is now a fully-fledged individual, beginning its life in the infant stage. In species where the parent drops the eggs off and leaves, they spend no time with their offspring, and they'll only meet them in person by sheer coincidence. Most sea turtles, for example, will lay their eggs under a layer of sand on a beach, and then they'll return to the ocean, and the baby turtles will hatch sometime later and live their lives without any guidance from their parents. Other animals, such as your typical K-selected viviparous animal, will continue to raise the infant as it ages, teaching it and protecting it and feeding it, until it reaches a point of maturation where it leaves the roost and goes out on its own to live its own life and find its own mates so as to reproduce and create offspring of its own. And that is the process of animal reproduction. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and interesting. This is one of those topics that I think is really neat because it hits so close to home. It's one thing to talk about plant reproduction because there's a few degrees of separation between us and plants, but when you start talking about animal reproduction, you start talking about human reproduction and things start to get really weird and crazy really fast. If you want to learn more about human reproduction, then just sit tight, because I have a future episode planned that will cover that exact topic. But as for today's episode, that's about it. Give it a like, subscribe if you're not subscribed, and consider supporting the podcast through Patreon, or by buying a kick-ass t-shirt at the official store. And as always, thanks for listening. Thank you.